So kicking off today's program is my wonderful colleague, David Yermak, the Albert Fingerhood Professor of Finance and Business Transformation and the chair of the Stern Finance Department. I don't believe there is anyone at Stern or maybe in the world who is more knowledgeable about the crypto asset landscape than David. So David will be speaking till about 11.20 or 11.25, and then he will field some questions. So audience, uh, please put your questions in Q&A. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to get to all questions. Um, and then I will take out one or two questions. Your anonymity will be respected and I will be asking David these questions. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, April. And it's great to see such a strong turnout for the conference. Um, I'm going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes, as April said, about the state of regulation in the crypto space. And a lot of this material is taken from the course that I've been teaching with colleagues here at NYU for, it's now seven years. We began in the fall of 2014. Um, at the time we had 30 students. We were the first such course in the world. And we've grown to several sections with hundreds of students. As you might guess, this has become a very popular topic, not only at NYU, but at many universities. But we've always jointly offered the course with NYU Law School and regulation, both understanding the current regulation, but even more so the normative view about regulation should be, has always been a central focus of what we're teaching. And I think a very good place to start is the front page of the New York Times two weekends ago. Um, I found this was rather extraordinary that the lead story at the very top of the front page was about crypto regulation. And I've just pulled out a couple of the main quotes. It says that the technology is disrupting the world of financial services so quickly and unpredictably that regulators are far behind. I think that's a very true statement. It continues that top officials from the Federal Reserve and other banking regulators have urgently begun what they are calling a crypto sprint to catch up with the rapid changes. And it points out that the basic problem here is that these are markets run by computer programs. They are decentralized. They typically don't have human leadership. And regulators can make all the rules that they want, but it's very difficult to enforce those rules. Um, the basic problem is that you can't put a computer program in jail the way that you can with the leadership of a financial services organization. Now, if regulators are far behind and sprinting to catch up, I think they have only themselves to blame. Um, this technology has been out there for 13 years almost at this point, and you know, at least at NYU for seven years, we've been teaching that this is not only very important, but it's here to stay. And I think the view is widely held that um, you're looking at some of the most fundamental changes in finance since the arrival of double entry bookkeeping, which was 700 years ago. But the regulators, especially in the US have gone through stages of ignorance, denial, contempt, hostility, um, there's just been an outright refusal to learn about the technology, understand its potential, both good and bad, and think about how the regulations that we have dating from the 1930s and earlier really need to be brought into the 21st century to deal with this on its own merits. For me, the low point was probably the interaction between the Securities and Exchange Commission and the community of promoters that were undertaking initial coin offerings. Much of this happened four years ago in 2017 and, and into 2018. So this was testimony on Capitol Hill by Jay Clayton, who was then the chair of the SEC, who made a categorical statement that I believe every ICO I've seen is a security. And his point was that we already have laws going back to the famous Howey case from the 1940s. There's laws on the books about how to deal with securities. These are securities, and so everyone needs to comply with those laws, case closed. The problem here is that there are many thousands of ICOs, and while some of them surely are securities, an awful lot of them are not. In fact, there are many interesting points of differentiation. A lot of them are carefully designed not to fall in the category of securities, and some of them are even stable coins which are designed never to rise in value in such a way that any expectation of return for the investor 
is a non sequitur, and that would fail you know, right away one of the four branches of the Howey test. So when Clayton says this, um, I think it just betrays an unwillingness to understand what's happening. It's, it's simply an ignorant statement by the head of the most important regulatory agency. And it belies you know, any, any interest in trying to understand what's new about this, why a blockchain-based token is different than a token in an organized market, and whether this regulator even has any, anything to say about this. So you know, I think there's actually three distinct problems with this approach, which is hardly unique to the SEC, but I think it's been most visible in that agency. So number one is simply an unwillingness to learn about the technology and engage with it on its own terms. The second point is that there's a pretty thinly veiled land grab here that the regulator seems more concerned with making sure that it's not the CFTC or the FDIC or some other agency, but they can preserve their regulatory market share. And simply by asserting, well, these are all securities, it's really another way to say these all come under our domain, our umbrella, and we will hire the staff and get the budget to take care of them and so forth. But I think the real problem with the whole attitude and you know, this statement and others that Jay Clayton made is that they completely miss the boat about the potential and the opportunity of the technology. What we heard and frankly continue to hear from the SEC is all kinds of warnings about fraud, consumer protection, this market is full of scams, invest at your own risk. Fortunately, a lot of people tuned all that out and went ahead and invested. And we now have data about how these projects are done. And so what's on the screen right now are the 10 biggest ICOs in terms of the capital raise. And there were two of them that raised into the billions and I think close to 20 that raised hundreds of millions. So there was far more money taken in than you would ever see in the IPO market or in the venture capital markets. And I think in their own way, people found this horrifying in Washington. Like, how can we let these startup businesses have so much capital? But where are we now? I, um, I went online just two days ago and of the top 10 here, one of them was closed down by an SEC intervention. That was Telegram, the, the second one on the list. They refunded essentially 70 cents on the dollar. But I think as everybody knows, Telegram is very much a going concern. And a company that fortunately was not held back by the SEC canceling their ICO. Of the others, four of them failed. Five of them are worth many multiples. You know, I think the leader of this is Filecoin, which April already mentioned in the introduction. Filecoin raised about a quarter of a billion, which people, again, were taken aback that so much capital would be given to a startup company. Um, today, it's worth like 40 times that, you know, $10 billion value of all those tokens. And you can see for the others, it's not just the top 10 either. You, know, you can go down the pecking order and the rates of return to ICOs have really been quite interesting, and you would only have wished to have been a diversified investor to have ignored the warnings from the SEC and to have taken the opportunity to participate in some of these markets. Now, whether these are securities, I think, remains an interesting legal question. Some of these are, some of these are not. But to regulate them with statutes and case law that predate the invention of the computer makes little sense. And there's just been an unwillingness to update many of these cases. And I think the SEC at this point is in over its head because it's brought a case against Ripple that it looks like it's losing in the procedural stages. And the SEC will probably go crawling over to Ripple looking to settle this case on terms very favorable to the industry. But we need a, a fresh start. We need to you know, reimagine this. There was really an extraordinary event last week where Coinbase, which is probably the leading crypto company, and one that has gone out of its way to be compliant with regulations to, to seek out the regulatory high ground, they published a screed about their experience in trying to register a new product. This was going to be a crypto lending product. I think they're going to lend out Bitcoins and other assets to short sellers and then share the rate of return with the account holders. So they approached the SEC and they took the SEC at its word that many times the commission has said, please come in and talk to us. Please consult with us. We'd like to give guidance and advice. And so the SEC, so Coinbase did exactly that. And 
if you read the publicity, um, what they said was that they never got any of their questions answered by the SEC. They were essentially stonewalled. At the bottom, it says, quote, not a single bit of actual guidance. What they got instead was a Wells notice that says we're going to sue you. And they got a rather unusual request to give to the SEC the names and addresses of all the people on the waiting list who were interested in becoming investors. So not the investors themselves, but simply expressions of interest. The regulator actually asked Coinbase to turn those over, which at the bottom, the CEO of Coinbase describes as sketchy behavior by the regulator. We don't have the other side of the story. We don't know how the SEC views this case, but you can only interpret this as you know, really a hostile interaction of the regulator with what has been you know, really the most successful startup in the financial world in many, many years. I mean, Coinbase should be a company that is being nurtured and advised, but instead it's simply running into a brick wall in Washington. So the hottest segment of crypto right now is the non-fungible token market, this crypto digital art. And these are tweets just in the last week of a, um, a punk on Solana that sold for a quarter of a million, and then a degenerate ape that sold for 1.1 million. And he is truly degenerate. You can see he's eating somebody's brain and is spattered with blood. Um, it's very interesting to look at this from an artistic and a financial point of view, but the SEC may be regulating these as securities. I mean, I find this, again, astonishing that the SEC thinks that this is what they should be regulating. We don't yet know how this is going to end, but to me, this is like the SEC trying to regulate Pokemon or you know, regulate World of Warcraft or even the market for secondary art sales. It's just you know, not anything that was imagined by the drafters of the statutes in the 1930s. And if the SEC you know, ends up asserting jurisdiction over the NFT market, I think they should probably also regulate the market for, for used cars, for used textbooks, you know, God knows what else. So where we are is that the industry doesn't take the regulators seriously because the regulators themselves haven't tried to engage and interact with the technology. Um, I think one of the real boneheaded overreaches was the bit license that was launched by the state of New York a couple of years ago to great fanfare. Rather than being an on-ramp, the bit license was so costly and cumbersome that people just left New York rather than comply with it. So the whole idea that we could have a Silicon Alley and a sort of a, a local entrepreneurial culture to maybe rival the one on the West Coast, it seems that the, the New York government did everything possible to prevent that from happening, which obviously is not good for job creation, for the, the universities and so forth. You've seen a lot of counterintuitive and even irrational regulations in, in the area of financial reporting, the idea that crypto assets should be carried at cost and not marked to market, that they're just treated as intangible assets and not like, like cash and, and marketable securities. It just defies logic because many of these things like Bitcoin and Ether and so forth have very liquid markets with daily prices and carrying them at book value is just nonsense in terms of presenting the financial positions of the firm. And on the tax side, the IRS years ago adopted the position that even if you use crypto as a medium of exchange for routine consumption spending, you are supposed to charge capital gains to your own portfolio and keep detailed records and report even though they don't enforce this with any of the private currencies or foreign currencies that circulate from time to time in the US. So fortunately, there are many other countries, more than 200 of them, and a lot of the others have been much more farsighted and proactive. So Switzerland carved out essentially a safe area called the Crypto Valley that acquired a big market share in the ICO market four years ago by having essentially more benign regulation. Um, Canada has greenlighted Bitcoin ETFs, which the SEC, after four years, continues to mull over without any real decision being taken. And some of the most aggressive countries, and I would include Singapore and the Emirates among them, have actually had government leadership, where in the case of the Emirates, they've mandated a transition of all public records to blockchains, I think by um, 22 or 23, but it's right around the corner. Singapore has been prodding its banking industry to engage with the technology and modernize its platforms. 
really the exact opposite of what you're seeing in the US. The big challenge that I think everyone agrees on is decentralized finance or DeFi. And um, DeFi is often described as Lego finance because you typically have a stack of five different layers of software beginning with the blockchain such as ethereum on the bottom and then the digital tokens the consumer applications I, i'm not going to go through this whole chart but promoters in the DeFi area are essentially taking smart contracts little bits and pieces of them chaining them or building them together almost like a tower of legos and creating digital platforms that essentially run themselves with no people involved no no human leadership these are in other words, algorithmic platforms. And here is a diagram of one of them. And I've put on the left some very recent journalism. This is the headline or the cover of The Economist in tomorrow's issue, actually. It's going to come out over the weekend, which is about DeFi and a story from the Financial Times about um, the fears about money laundering and so forth. So this is the platform of MakerDAO showing somebody bringing in some Ether tokens locking them into an escrow vault and getting a die stable coin balance in return. This is really a margin loan, but it's done with no KYC and really no accountability for the computer program that's running this in a decentralized way. I think it's a huge challenge for the regulators. That if you want to collect tax or avoid money laundering and so forth, you need to understand this technology and try to stay a step ahead of it. And I think What's happened in the US is this, they forfeited this opportunity. You know, that the work on this should have started five years ago because everyone has seen this coming. The idea of the smart contract inspired the creation of Ethereum in 2013. It was launched in 14. But the, the agencies have really waited seven years until now to, to get on board and try to understand this. And the train has already left the station without the regulator on board. Okay, so David, so, we have a very provocative question from the yeah, audience. Yeah, go ahead, April. Um, well, the question is, do you think crypto should be regulated by federal gaming laws? And I think that's very provocative because I think it gives an, um, an indication of, of where the, uh, you know, where the person is thinking of, about crypto. You know, I could give a lengthy answer, April, but I'll just say no, that this is not gambling. You know, this is finance. And I, I think asking such a question is, um, um, I, let's just call it cheeky, but leave it at that. You know, this is maybe the attitude is similar to what we see from the regulators, that they're not taking this seriously as a financial instrument. And to the extent that that's your point of view, I'm surprised you would even attend the conference. So let me just make one further point, April, which is that um, there's, a roadblock in the US Senate. There's actually a lot of agencies that are not moving on this because they don't have leadership in place. And these are a couple of recent stories about how um, the Biden administration has been unable to get hearings. Um, a lot of this is because Ted Cruz has put the holds on a lot of nominees because of stuff going on in Ukraine, which I think is probably interesting and important. But what is really happening here is vacancies are being left in very important roles. And I don't think we can expect much progress in the US until the Senate unlocks the gates and allows some of these agencies to actually have leadership appointed to them. You know, that many of these agencies are in holding patterns, not totally of their own fault, but because the Senate has used them as political footballs. So one could say much more about the infrastructure bill, the the controversies about crypto taxing and so forth, but you know, people in government are just far, far behind industry. So let me stop as promised. We have five minutes and I would be happy to take um, further questions, especially about the financial nature of these instruments. Okay, so I'm uh, going to read, we have, um, we have two questions. One is on tax, would you, would you be, in, okay. So uh, should there be taxation on gains through crypto? oversight and trade, et cetera, or should the market remain unregulated? I think any capital asset is covered by the Internal Revenue Code. So, you know, just like in principle, you pay capital gains on stocks and bonds and even on the sale of your house and so forth, there's probably a very straightforward case that crypto should be taxed. Now, there's two problems. One is that it's also used as a payment instrument, as a currency, and we do separate foreign currency traders who speculate in these markets 
from tourists who bring euros back from Europe and then spend them a year later and have capital gains. The, the government never tries to collect the capital gain in the later case. And I think you need to understand that these instruments play multiple roles and really find a way only to tax the investment portion. The other thing is there are really many special instances of crypto that require guidance from the Internal Revenue Service. So if there's a hard fork and a new coin is created, what's the basis of the investor in that new coin that they acquired from the fork? Um, if there's an airdrop and you don't receive the airdrop, how do you deal with that? If you mine crypto, what's the basis in the coins that you've acquired by mining? Um, a lot of this really requires thoughtful rulemaking and despite a few vague promises, the Internal Revenue Service has been very, very slow to engage on some of these questions that are blindingly obvious. So I think you know, the simple answer to the question is, of course, it should be taxed. But then the agency needs to do its job and lay down the ground rules. And these ground rules have to be logical. And we've just not seen that from the IRS. Okay, so let me just close with one question. So if there was one thing you would like to get across, if there's one point that you would like to make, or one thing from your discussion uh, that you'd like people to take away, can you tell us what that might be? I think most of the financial assets in the world will be tracked by blockchains within 10 years. And this is a very different technology than double entry bookkeeping. It's already well underway in certain markets. And the regulator needs to stay in front of this and ideally be a facilitator. But we've seen quite the opposite. We've seen stonewalling, denial, resistance, and so forth. Um, I skipped this slide. It goes, it's another seven stages of regulation and it starts with gestation and infancy and childhood. I think, um, we're at stage two, infancy, where the regulator is trying to adapt existing laws and structures, but still has about five stages to go through to regulate a technology that is moving much, much, much faster than the regulator seems to understand. So the technology is not going to stop, and the regulator needs to um, you know, increase its capabilities. The Senate needs to confirm nominees. and. Um, we can't think that laws from the 1930s are going to be adequate to deal with a very different type of technology. Okay, David, thank you very much. Um, as always, very provocative, very interesting. Uh, we really appreciate the time, you know, you, know, you, know, you, you putting in the time, you know, to come here. Thank and, you, April. Um, yeah, thank, 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 thank you very much.